with the original founders of our country, Canada. Now, Mr. Smallwood, these are the, uh, this is the film uh, for the archives that we're building up to <coughs> commemorate your presence in Newfoundland. I gathered the CBC some months ago have done a film, and I thought like, the uniqueness of our television has always been to be as far ahead as we can, so we're letting you see what we intended to release uh, half an hour after we hear that you've gone to join your father. And I just wanted to get your impressions on how you think we're making out with our technique here, years or so and uh, what else you'd like to add, looking down now on Newfoundland from your exalted position, uh, what kind of things do you think you'd like to add to what we're doing or say to the Newfoundland people? Because I think in retrospect they look at you a great deal and think of you a great deal differently in retrospect than we ever do when we're all here in presence, as they say in Newfoundland, to have a hundred percent saying nice things about you, you almost got to be gone. Yeah. Well, Jeff, uh, it's a little eerie <laughs> to, uh, to be told in cold blood that is, if you are capable of having cold blood, which I doubt, but to be told in cold blood or even warm blood, uh, Joey, this is something that... Uh, I propose to uh, put on the uh, TV after you're gone. Well, the other, the, after the CBC have already done one at your office, I understand. They've done one, and the uh, Memorial University uh, tomorrow are calling for me, and they want me to go up to their, uh, they have a, a television, radio yeah. a place of their own at the university, which I find, uh, you know, I find that... Uh, <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, I, I don't, it's not so very long ago when the Newfoundland people didn't have enough to eat or wear. And their homes, the homes of tens of thousands of people, uh, the homes are wearing out. The floor canvas was gone, the blinds and curtains were gone, and the windows, window panes that get broken up, they had to find a piece of cardboard or something that they couldn't afford the glass. And we were in a bad way. That's not awfully long ago, Jeff. And uh, now, to think of our having a university, and the university is so big and uh, flourishing that they actually have a radio and television uh, studio of their own in it. And because tomorrow they're calling for me and they want me to go up and uh, record uh, a show to be uh, put archives. on the air, for the archives they call it, but I mean they don't, they're not fooling me for one minute. They're doing something to put on after I'm dead. <laughs> the CPC have done that and now, now you're doing it. I, I don't see why you're doing it because God in heaven, Jeff, unless you're going to turn your uh, CJON into just CJ, CJOE or CJOEY, and turn it into a, a Joey station, unless you're going to do that. For heaven's sake, haven't you got uh, oodles and oodles and oodles of uh, film of me along with yourself? One night we went on for five hours, I think it was, five hours live without a break, five hours, which is probably a record on television anywhere in the world up to that time. And then a little while after that, we went on again, and I, did, I think it was uh, six hours, or was it six and a half? And then a little while after that, we went on for eight hours. Well, now, you have the eight hours now stored up. I hope you have a police guard on it, the RCMP maybe, and the... We got it in the archives. But that was six and seven years ago. I mean, what, what, I, what I felt that we'd be doing is we're updating so that you have at least, I mean, maybe these, these films will be here after all of us are gone and you're still around updating. Yeah. But uh, what I thought makes it interesting is, to, first of all, to see, for you to see what the, the kind of things we were doing and the extracts of your voice that we were going to use and, uh, and to see and add to it now, like you have the opportunity to add to anything you want to say, any message you want to pass down, I mean, it, it may be a little airy, on the other hand, we wouldn't be as a network 
very confident if we didn't have the Only Living Father Confederation film ready uh, and well mixed with uh, the highlights of his career uh, and, and that's you know as, a, as probably the, certainly the most prominent Newfoundlander uh, among us uh, it'll be self-evident on the evening of the passing and I know it's unusual maybe to to do this kind of a film with a person uh, yet if we don't do it we're not preparing uh, ourselves adequately as a as a uh, a network how did you like what you saw so far uh, well first of all may I say I'll be furious absolutely furious if you put on a TV show of me and I'll not be able to see it you know there must be some way we could arrange after I go to see it somehow somewhere well by by some means is there any possibility human or inhuman human or divine well for me to see this uh, TV show well they say that you just uh, d uh, sort of lay down your body and uh, and you and the spirit moves out of the body and that the dimensions can be seen through. Maybe we can't uh, see you, but you can see the television set. <laughs> I wonder. Who knows? Well, if I see it and don't like it... Will you send me a letter? Will there be some way to let you know that I don't like it? Well, this is why I'm showing it to you now. Well, I tell you, <laughs> what I have seen up to now, Jeff, if I had to make a criticism, if I were a critic writing for a newspaper, I would say, Jeff Sterling, who has made this a TV thing is a man very evidently and he betrays himself he exposes himself in this movie uh, as a man of deep emotion of sentiment of uh, love of the poetical and the artistic and the beautiful uh, because if I had to make a criticism it would be that the thing is just a little bit ideal, a little bit ethereal, a little bit airy, a little bit poetical, whereas the fact of the matter is, of course, that although it's true, like you, I, I too have that large element in me. I never forget, I don't forget something about you, you know, that you may forget yourself. You have more relatives who were Christian priests, clergymen, ministers, than anybody I know, and then in addition to that, you had a great relative who was a medical doctor and a great figure in our history in Brigus, in Harbor Grace, and in Trilligate, and then, supremely, you have a relative who is probably the greatest musician, the greatest singer has ever produced uh, uh, Georgina Sterling, the, the daughter of Dr. Sterling. Uh, Georgina Sterling, who was born in Twillingate and died in the, the mid-1920s, I think, was the only uh, opera star, the only opera singer that Newfoundland has produced. And uh, she sang in the, uh, the sky in Newfoundland, in North Italy. And she sang all over Europe. Relative of yours, Jeffrey, I would imagine she'd be your, let's say, Dr. Sterling, who's probably your great grandfather, and his daughter, therefore, would be your great aunt, I would think. Yeah, I think. Your great aunt. Great, great grandfather. Yeah. Uh, I would say that, uh, that Georgina Sterling, uh, who, by the way, came back to me from that once on a visit. Such a 
gigantic uh, congregations, gigantic audience. And your great aunt, or great great aunt, Georgina Surrey, that's Mademoiselle Twillingay, is her professional name, sang and thrilled the hearts of thousands of her fellow Newfoundlanders on that occasion. Now, I keep remembering that every time I see your material success. I'll never have that You're a very successful. Your mind. And I see this. When I first that notwithstanding you, Rainy Levesque, I doubt if you had I know Rainy Levesque very well. I know him personally. I know him pretty intimately. Once now I invited him down to Newfoundland, I held a thinker's conference in St. Anyway, John's for three days, days, days and he came down and attended it. Personal. And we wound it up, he and I, going on television. I think about that. And, and most people see you as an able and an energetic and a progressive and a very ambitious and man. But he I was see so you magnificent. in another light altogether. I see you he was such as a, a man charismatic personality. of emotion, a man of deep sentiment. And it would be most surprising if you were not, because, you know, the, the bloodstream in you is the bloodstream of artistic and religious people. And while you may have some peculiar mental ideas, intellectual ideas, the people, some people would say were peculiar. Like free enterprise. <laughs> well, to some people that is a very peculiar, but it, yeah, it's, it's very unusual. But it's funny, Joseph, that the, the... And the show that you put on so far, that we've been looking at here now, uh, is uh, very much dictated by that part of you. Uh, the practicality in of my in life, spite of my career, career in I public you. life, you don't even touch on the roads I built, the roads I paved. Jeffrey Sterling, let me ask you a question. If I were to say to you that the biggest thing I had ever done in my life in the 23 years, I was straw boss, general foreman of Newfoundland. The biggest thing was to build 5,000 miles of new roads. The biggest thing, and that I paved 2,000 of those 5,000 miles. The biggest thing I did. Would you quarrel with that? You wouldn't. I wouldn't quarrel. I don't know if that's the biggest thing. I think that the well, contribution... Well, all right, if I were, Okay, then. Okay. The university. Well, if I were to say know. that the biggest thing I did was to build 1,000 brand new schools all over this province of Newfoundland and Labrador and that hundreds of them were so beautiful, so big, so modern, so well lit, well ventilated, well heated, well equipped that there were very, very, very few schools in St. John's to equal hundreds of the big new schools that were built in uh, Labrador City and City of Wabush and Churchill Falls and Goose Airport, Happy Valley, built in Gander and Grand Falls and, uh, and Corner Brook and Grand Bank and Fortune and Placentia and Bonavista and Twillingate and Lewisport and Springdale and Carboneer and Harbor Grace and so on and so on and so on and so on. If I were to say that the building of those thousand new schools, uh, the university, uh, and by the way, uh, you know, uh, it's no time for pride, but I can't help it. I'm very proud to be one of the few persons alive in Canada today who started a university. Did you ever create a university? No, I sure didn't. Uh, is there anybody else in Newfoundland that ever created a university? I don't know of anybody. Are there many across Canada that ever did? And then uh, 18, 18 vocational trade schools. 18. There isn't one in Newfoundland to this moment that I didn't put there. You realize that? Not one single solitary vocational trade school in Newfoundland today except those that I put there, 18 of them. Oh, if I were to say that building the technical college, if I were to say that uh, bringing in the school bus system in Newfoundland, the first and the only school bus system we've had is now costing millions of dollars every year to run. Just the school, bringing in the regional high schools, bringing in the central high schools. Uh, 
uh, uh, giving the NTA, the, the teachers, very special legal and constitutional recognition. You know, we gave them the checkoff, do you? You know what the checkoff means? Checkoff means this. If you're a teacher in Newfoundland today and you're a member of the NTA, your dues that you have to pay as a member of the NTA are deducted from your pay by the government. Reverse it. And uh, passed over to the NTA. The NTA don't have the bother or the expense of collecting the dues from their members. You know what that's done for the NTA? It's given them a hell of a fund, I should think. It's given them a big fund. It's made them an extremely powerful body. And if there are to be unions, Jeff Sterling, and of course there are, if there are to be unions, do you know any crowd more justifiably organized in a powerful union than our teachers? Do you? Do no, you I know don't. any crowd who more justifiably, who more justly, who more properly should be organized and organize in a very, very powerful union than our teachers. And that has resulted in this action of ours to uh, not only to legalize them, but to give them the check off in their dues. The whole picture in education, if I were to say, is the biggest thing, would you agree? Well, I, I think education would certainly be one of the consequences. Say you're, but may I ask? Well, if you didn't agree, and I, I would agree say with to that. you, okay, building, uh, building the huge addition to the general hospital, putting up most of the money to build the vast uh, St. Clair's Hospital, putting up most of the money to build the tremendous uh, Grace Hospital, to, to uh, build the big expansion to the uh, Nervous Diseases Hospital, to build that big hospital in Grand Falls, the big one in Corner Brook, the big one in Gander, the big one in uh, Labrador, two, three in Labrador. 28 new hospitals. Would you say that that was the biggest thing I had done in my 23 years? No, but I would say it was one of the things. That's why it's amazing to go over the various things you did accomplish. But looking down now, looking back in hindsight. Yeah. Uh, looking down from heaven. Looking down from heaven. Looking down. Assuming, on, assuming that that's where I end up. Well, I think you got a, a, a chance. A pretty good. Have a I got chance. a fighting chance? I think to get so. There? I I think that uh, that if you look at a man's life and what he did with his life and how he spent his life in service and the things the the thousands of Newfoundlanders who benefit from the schools and the thousands and thousands of us who benefited from the roads which tied together the country and the university complexes and the hospitals what would what other things would you have if you look down and say I could have done it all over again what what would if you could come back to Newfoundland and have another 23 years uh, and maybe according to Hindis, you'll be reincarnated back into Newfoundland, as that's their theory, that you just, like, uh, you, you, many, many times we come back and do service, and it's like a kindergarten, we suddenly learn all our, all our lessons and then go on. But say you, you came back, what would you like to do next? Where would you like to carry Newfoundland? What advice would you give for those who look ahead 23, five more years, you know? Uh, the whole world, the, I've heard a theory stated in Ottawa and here in St. John's by Ottawa people that really it's now sort of old-fashioned to think of productive industry, that the service industries have become as important as the productive industries. Now, I reject that. I be rejected completely. It seems to me that in any society, in any system of society, any system of government, basic production, it's the goods that are produced from the earth, from the sea, from the land, from underneath the surface of the land, from the forests, the actual things that are produced. You know the old saying about making two blades of grass grow where one grew before actual production. It seems to me to be basic, to be fundamental, that you can argue and debate 
and discuss afterwards how you'll divide, how you'll split, what the division will be, what the, the, what's a fair way to divide, what's been, how will you cut the pie, how big will each slice be. Will you get one slice or two slices? Will you get a thick slice and I'll get a little thin slice? How you divide the wealth that's produced? Uh, that is a matter of opinion, it's a matter for debate, it's a matter for argument, it's a matter for making laws, it's a matter for social arrangement. But you know, all that is really talking about the pie that's to be sliced. It's the size of the pie that is important. It's how much that is produced. Now, in Newfoundland, God has given us certain natural wealth. And one of the great bits of natural wealth is something that many people, hardly anyone, thinks of. Many people don't think of. And that is this. If you draw a line across Newfoundland, say from Basin uh, Road, Cape St. George, you remember Bill Keogh's last forgotten fisherman? Uh, on the George. Bill of Cape St. George. You draw a line from the Bill of Cape St. George over to, say, Bacaloo Island. Okay? Now, south of that line, uh, the harbors, the good ones, the medium ones, the middle ones, the bad ones, all the harbors, south of that line are what you might call all-weather seaports. That's to say, Virtually any one of the 365 days, the ship can get in and out. Sure. It's an all-weather seaport. Their language, okay. their you know mother tongue. The seaports that God their gives philosophy, in Newfoundland, their the all-weather seaports. Their tradition, are one of his greatest their gifts. history and their way of life. And we are a, a non-grateful people and a stupid and unimaginative people if we don't uh, recognize that and make full use of it. That's what I had in mind when I backed the oil refinery for Combat Chance. There was a way to use uh, one of God's gifts to Newfoundland, the deep water, all-weather seaports. But whether it's an all-weather seaport or minerals under the earth or oil underneath the earth or natural gas underneath the earth, whether that earth be covered with water such as the Atlantic Ocean, or just some lake in, uh, and after all, remember this, that if there's oil or natural gas under Grand Lake or Red Indian Lake or Deer Lake or Gander Lake, that's fresh water, or under the salt water off the coast of Labrador or the coast of the island of Newfoundland, that is wealth that God put there. And all with timber, minerals, water, water power, water falling, falling water, which is the cheapest way we have found yet in the world to generate uh, electricity. So what do you think of the future of generating from the waves of the ocean, this new development? I think, uh, I'm not sure of how good that might be for Newfoundland, although God knows we do have waves, we do have m movement of the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, and I've been watching carefully some experiments that have been going on in England and Scotland along that line. I don't think they have the tempestuous water, tempestuous and violent water movement on their coast that we have no. on ours. But the thing that interests me enormously is the, the sun. The solar energy. Solar energy. Uh, that may turn out to be of all the cheapest and the best and the safest kind of electricity to be developed from the sun. But whether it be falling water or the movement of the ocean or the burning of oil, and that seems like a terrible thing to be doing to take one of the natural resources with which God endowed us, whether it's under the dry land or the wet land or off the sea coast, and we bring that oil up, or we bring that, that oil up, and just burn it, just burn the oil to create heat, to heat our buildings and homes and schools and churches. In fact, or to generate electricity, it seems to me, is the most wasteful thing you can do with that oil. It's 
almost like taking spruce and fir and burning it for firewood to heat your home, you know, when in fact you can take that same wood, spruce, fir, and other species of wood, and you can turn it into food. You can turn it into all kinds of things. In uh, Rotterdam, in Holland, I went in a great oil refinery, and I saw the experimenting uh, experimentation that went on with BA, British, uh, British. Uh, uh, not British, the, the great uh, br new the British Petroleum? BP, British Petroleum, owned by the British government. They had this vast oil refinery there making, I think it was 300,000, using 300,000 barrels of oil a day, crude oil, as three times the size of combat tanks, which is 100,000 barrels of crude oil a day. 300,000 barrels. And they were experimenting with Deny it the my producing cattle feed, just because they're poultry feed, animal and poultry feed from the crude oil. And I saw it, and I saw the, the experiment, I saw the way they were doing it, and I saw the results of the feeding of that food to animals and poultry. Now, that would seem to be a more useful way to use up that oil than just to burn it wouldn't it, you see? And then again, you can use that oil to make petrochemicals. And would you, let me ask you if you can make a guess. If you have an oil refinery and you bring the crude oil to it and you turn that crude oil into a finished product, now that finished product is either kerosene oil or gasoline or bunker C or bunker A, you know, uh, stove oil or heating oil, you turn it into the finished product. If you take that finished product and you don't use it to drive your motor cars or your trucks or your buses, and you don't use it to heat your buildings, but if you take that finished product and turn it into petrochemicals, have you got any rough idea of how many different products are now made in this world from petrochemicals, you've got me a rough idea of how many different articles. For instance, the blind, the curtains on your window, the tablecloth on your table, uh, many things are made from uh, petrochemicals. Have you got any rough idea how many all? Well, I know it. I know it goes into the hundreds or maybe thousands. There are three thousand different products. Now, isn't that a more useful and sensible thing to do? with your crude oil, because there must be a limit to how much crude oil there is. Well, isn't it more sensible, too, to, to make uh, houses and, and out, of, out of cabins or log cabins than just have it for one day and have a daily newspaper? I mean, isn't it maximizing the raw material? Isn't it smoking the codfish? Smo and, and therefore, instead of selling codfish as, as just codfish, selling them as smoked codfish, smoking the herring, putting up the the smoked uh, mussels, uh, uh, the smoked uh, all the the maximization of the of the protein certainly would be the next step in Newfoundland's history. Would be to maximize everything before it leaves the country, not send out a block of cod. Not only Newfoundland, but, but any, yes, but we're talking about Newfoundland, yeah. and you're looking down, presumably in this, in hindsight, as the other things we could do for the next quarter of a century. And I guess maximization, as you say, of all the products, whether it's the oil or the gas or the fish or the or timber. the timber, the minerals. And by maximizing, like we've raised the cost of, in the last year, the, 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 the cost and value of fish has, has almost gone up 50 million or 100 million. Well, it looks like in the, as, we, as protein goes up, our value of our fish and smoked salmon is a 5 or $6 item. Uh, Newfoundland lobsters uh, could be the highest priced lobsters in the world. Well, uh, they that should seems be. to be where it is. They should be. They're the best lobsters. They are. Caught in cold water there. But Jeff, something that has been... I, I, I've just been away. I was down to Florida. Uh, I sold my apartment down there and I was down there to superintend the packing of my furniture. I had a whole lot of little things. I didn't want them to disappear. And I was there superintending uh, to bring them back to Newfoundland. Okay. And I learned something. You know what I learned? I learned that in two or three or four or five years. By 1984. Yeah. 
In a very few years, cameras, the ordinary the styles of cameras there are in the world, they will all just disappear. Uh, a brand new uh, principle, a new idea altogether has been developed. Uh, which makes, reminds me of this. I'm old enough now, you are too. You're not as old as I am. But you're old enough to look back at, say, in the 1920s, uh, when practically everything there was... Well, I was only born in the 1920s, so I... Well, Howard, you wouldn't remember. I wasn't very old. But I do. I remember the 1920s and so many things that were old-fashioned. What, Look what, back what, at them now, all fashion. Well, what are they done with cameras? I mean, why? What's going to disappear? You mean the instant camera, the instamatic cameras, the camera? New principle altogether. Oh, However, that's video. that's another. That's that's just by way of illustrating the point I am making. And the point I'm making is this: that today we look back at the 1920s and 30s and 40s, and some people look back at the 1950s. And God save us, there are people beginning to look back at the 1960s, which is a, a, a few moments ago. Ten years ago. Yeah. Uh, looking back at these as old-fashioned, out of date, old-fashioned. Uh, people can smile, they can be amused at all how old-fashioned things were. Everything. Houses, clothing, motor cars, radios, television. Um, the kind of hats people wore, everything you can think of was old-fashioned. Now, just as we today look back at things 15, 20, 25 years ago as being old-fashioned, amusing, funny, you know, today we're at the peak, the peak up to now, the peak of everything that's modern, 25 years from now. The year 2005. Yeah. In the year 2000, around there, 20, 25 years from now, what do you will we be looking back at things as they are now in this present year, which is 1900 and... Uh, the end 70, of 78. 1978. Uh, that just as we look back at things 20 years ago and are very amused, so in the year 2000, 20, 25 years from now, people will look back at 1978 as being... You know, uh, you know, uh, you know, amusingly old-fashioned and well, primitive. Well, for example, you saw the Royal Canadian Mounted Police officer who went over to witness the craft, the 2,200 feet craft, 2,000 yeah. feet high. Yeah. And he's looking at it through high binoculars and telescope, and it's only 880 yards away. And he's explaining there's no doors, there's no openings, there's no windows, that it's staying there. Uh, at a 2,000 foot elevation, moving slightly one way and the other, and then up and down, and it stayed there for an hour and a half, and he's got the binoculars, uh, the telescope on it, and there's two other witnesses. Well, this is means as an anti-gravitational device, whether it's in the hands of the Russians or the Americans, but nevertheless, there's an anti-gravitational device that's being confirmed in sightings all around the world, and it stayed there over Random Isle in Elliot's Cove for an hour and a half while he had lots of time to go back, set up his tripods, close in, zoom in on the thing, see that the, the, the metal was not aluminum but a gray, a dense kind of metal with the bottom of it in, 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 in light lit with a, with, a, with a glow, an inner glow of energy and it stayed there and he watched it and then he saw it and he watched it for the hour and a half with the other witnesses. Well that proves it's an anti-gravitational... Uh, By anti-gravitational you mean a thing that the law of gravity doesn't work on. That's right. It defies the law of gravity. That's right. It's not sucked down or drawn down to the earth. That's right. It can there s hover there. Well, we're talking about in 25 years, it may be a it may be a commonplace thing to have that vehicle, uh, which is which is totally breaking all the laws that we know. All the laws of nature. The, well, the, uh, the, uh, the the total. Uh, transportation laws that we know it and all of these different things are being changed by this anti-gravitational device which was confirmed by an official confirmation at the Clarenville and other places around the world and pictures of it and so on. Well, if that has got to be a reality, well, that means that the whole thing we know about gravity and transportation and movement around the earth is different and it's going to be self-evident, I should imagine, in the next decade, let alone 25 years. And you heard him, you saw, you heard the entire testimony, and you saw his pictures. He was an intelligent fellow. 
He was no fool. No, and he, and he watched this thing under a high-power telescope at 880 yards, 2,000 feet in the air, and he was able to close in on it in the zoom lens and, and, and see it all and see there was no windows and, the, and it was... How far away was it from him? 880 yards. From him? From him. 880, call it 900, that's 2,700 feet. Well, 880 yards, a little high, under half a mile. 880 yeah, yards is half a mile, and it was 2,000 feet high, and he estimated it's 200 feet 2,000 feet is nothing, Jeff. That's right. And we were... Uh, we, I mean, high is right, nothing. That's right. It's, it's, well, it's... it's the, the Airplanes the, very rarely fly as low as that. Well, the tower in Toronto, the, the, the high tower there is 1,800 feet high. So 2,000 feet isn't very high. Yeah. And uh, there it was at 2,000 feet, uh, uh, hovering, and it stayed there long enough for him to go back to the headquarters of the RCMP, get his telescope, get his uh, stand, come down to, uh, come down to the uh, uh, place where the, on the Marine Drive where the witnesses were watching it under a, a, a binoculars where they'd, they'd call him. And he was able to set up the tripod, set up the telescope, zoom in on the on the vehicle, confirm the fact it wasn't a, it wasn't a plane, it wasn't a helicopter, it had no uh, propellers, it had no engines, it only had a little pyramid at the end, as he drew in the in his diagram. Well, that seems to me to change our whole conception of what the future is going to be, because here, well, uh, look, look, look. I remember, well, I don't remember everything, uh, but in my own lifetime, the first airplane, in my lifetime. You remember the first airplane? No, I don't remember. No, but it was in your lifetime. In my lifetime, right. the first airplane, practically speaking, the first telephone, Right. certainly the first uh, wireless. You were 18 or 19 years of age before they really got in the, in the, in the, in the flights. Well, I flew in the year 1918. I flew myself. And the first plane that ever flew was only about uh, 17 years before that. The Blerio, uh, the uh, the brothers, the two brothers in the... Uh, Alcock and Brown. No, 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 no in the United States. Oh, the, the two... two uh, huh? The Wright brothers. The Wright brothers. The Wright brothers. Right. Uh, Orville and Wilmer, right. Wilbur uh, Wright. Uh, eight, 17 years before I flew, they were the first on this earth to fly in, in well, a heavy air... To our knowledge. Uh, to in, other words, in other words, if we go back into mythology... Oh, we'll... yeah, well, that's another matter. Yeah. But, uh, and that's happened in my lifetime. The telephone was virtually... I knew every telephone number in St. John's. I knew I could take... A, you wouldn't lift it up and ask. You'd... you'd, you'd crank you'd, it. You'd crank it, lift up the receiver, and you'd, you'd ask for the number. And the operator would give you the number. You knew every I could number ask yourself. every number in St. John's. There was no telephone because there were many. How many, how many would there be at that time? Uh, 50, 60, 70 telephone telephones. numbers. In St. In St. John's. John's. Indeed. What Some year was of, that? Super small one? I'm thinking 1970, 1980, right. 1919. The okay. end of World War II. That's World right. World War I. During the war and after, right. the airplane, the telephone, uh, wireless, wireless. Uh, the typewriter, now the typewriter was there before I was born, but they were a clumsy, big clumsy thing, and there weren't many of them. Most of the firms up and down Water Street, and when they would send a letter out to anyone, it would be typed on this clumsy typewriter. So many of them wrote it by hand, but those that did type it, Barring Brothers, and a few of the larger firms had typewriters. They'd have one typewriter, and the letters... Uh, one firm right. would have a one typewriter. It's like Not, having a computer. In it. Yeah, the one yeah. typewriter. It was a big and a big clumsy typewriter. They would type the letter and they'd send the letter, but the the way they didn't have carbon paper. There was no carbon paper. You know how they kept a copy of that letter? They put it in a book with tissue paper, and a damp cloth or something went over it, and they'd close the cover of the big book and they put it in a press and they'd wind the press and tighten it up. And that's how they copied the letters they sent. I've, I've seen hundreds of uh, duplicates of letters like that. Uh, airplane, telephone, a wireless, typewriter. Television? Well, television only the day before yesterday. You know, I was, I was getting to be an old man before television came in, you see. San Laurent and Radio, yourself. well, uh, yeah. Louis San Laurent and I, the Prime Minister of Canada and I, opened your first right. 
uh, satellite first, station. First satellite through through uh, Argentia. 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 That's right. 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 We did that. But that was only 1955. But in the 1920s, early 1920s, I did my first radio broadcast with Ern Ash. Ernie Ash. Did you know Ernie? You no. know his son. I know his son. Roy Ash. Well, Ernie Ash was a great pioneer. And you ask your 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 buddy, uh, you know, from Oscar Hurley. Oscar Hurley. I he'll tell you about Ernie Ash. Well, Ernie and I are great friends, and I did my first broadcasting in his home. He had a little uh, television, a uh, radio uh, outfit right. in his own home. That'd be he was up on McKay Street, just off off uh, Lazy Street. And that's the first radio show you did? Yeah, that was in about the mid-1920s. So I've seen the birth, the coming of radio, and of course I've seen the coming of... But look at all the other things that have happened. It's incredible. It's just, you know, sensational. Uh, the only cloth you could get was cotton and wool. There was no such thing as the cloths, the various fabrics Nylons or made from uh, oil. oil. All you know, the byproducts. Dacron and Norlon and, and Nylon and uh, all the other lons. Uh, that's all new. The, but, 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 while life was so crude before those inventions, uh, will the time, and we look back at it and say, well, for God's sake, how do they live? How do they do without it? Uh, I remember there was not one single solitary bus in all St. John's. There was the streetcar system, and that covered only a small part of the city. And when that went, you walked, you hoofed it. There was no way to get around. There were perhaps 20 people in St. John's that had motor cars. Do you think it was a bad uh, mistake to give up those the 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 the, uh, the, the, uh, the trams that are that were so reliable? that gave and give such incredible uh, uniqueness to the town like San Francisco has. Yeah. Uh, and it would have maintained a tremendous uniqueness in St. John's. And in the weather like we have now, does it, is it impossible to, to think that they could have been a mistake to remove them? Well, instead of removing them, I think perhaps it would have been very practical if they had not only held them, but extended them, built, laid down new tracks and covered as the town expanded. Do you know, and not very many people alive in St. John's today who know this, that where the track came up that people do remember, there are thousands living today who remember the streetcar track, you go down Water Street and you turn up, uh, is Allendale it Holds, Street. Holdsworth Street there? Allendale, Allendale. No, 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 turn up the hills to Duckworth Street, Holdsworth. Holdsworth, and then turn around. Uh, up opposite, opposite the Siemens Institute. Right. Turn up there and then turn to the right and go down Duckworth Street right. and around in front of the Newfoundland Hotel right. and come up, up Military, military Road. Road to Rollins Cross. Right. And at Rollins Cross it would turn to the left and come around and then turn to the right and go along Queens Road. Right. Do you know, there are very few people who know that that wasn't always the case. It would come up Military Road and it would reach Rollins Cross and keep on going up Harvey Road and along the Marching Road. I didn't know that. No, most people didn't. And along the Marching Road. That's right. Went up Harvey Road from Rollins Cross to go up past the convent, past the Roman Catholic Cathedral, past the fire hall, not by the fire hall, but go past it, and along uh, Military Road. Uh, and along La Marchand Road, past the CLB Armory, and right along La Marchand Road, and I think, uh, this I'm not sure of, but I think it went down Patrick Street and joined Water Street. They cut out that hole, and I remember, I remember seeing the rails, the tracks, the streetcar tracks. Uh, they were just barely covered, you know, by, uh, I think they took up the rails and probably took them up and sold them for scrap. Uh, if they had extended the streetcar system, it might have been better, but anyway, they closed it out altogether. I guess it's academic now. And for a while, you walked. And when young Elliot, forget his first name, Stan Elliot's son, when Stan Elliot's son, a young fellow in his 20s, decided to start a bus system in St. John's, there was almost, you might say, a roar of laughter from the people, the idea of thinking. Well, that people were going to patronize that streetcar, that uh, bus system. Because what happened then, Jeff, was this. Thousands of people every morning would walk down, uh, they'd walk down uh, the hills, 
uh, Flower Hill and the one uh, Casey Street and Flower Hill and uh, and uh, uh, Carter Barter. Barters, Carters, Barters Hill and Carters Hill and Longs Hill. They'd walk down and they'd go to work in the shops and the offices and on the waterfront along. There'd be several thousand every morning. Lunchtime, they'd go home up over the hill to their homes, to the higher levels to have their lunch. After lunch, they'd walk down My again and go to work. Sister, Canadians, and if they were working that night, they'd go home at six o'clock to their meal. A dinner or a supper, no and then they come down again at seven o'clock and work till nine or nine thirty. Up and down, up and down, and the idea that, that so you're going to get buses and people are going to pay money to ride in those buses where they've been used to. By the way, one of the funniest things that you've ever heard. There was a proposal, and if I'm not mistaken, I think I'm the one who made the proposal. As your loyal, I made the proposal in the 1920s. Of that on Carter's Hill and Barter's Hill, now we which were the two principal hills to take people up to the higher levels, there be uh, put an escalator so that it, at the bottom of Barter's Hill and the bottom of Carter's Hill, you'd pay your two cents or three cents or whatever it would be, and you get on a, a, an escalator which would take you up to the top of the hill. But the idea that people would patronize a bus system, and he started that bus system, and that went so well that when it failed, I mean, it failed financially, but the people got so used to it that when the bus system collapsed, and the buses stopped, and there were no buses, the people were stricken. You wouldn't know what a disaster had hit St. Well, I guess it had for and It was a disaster because it was running, I don't know, two or three years and people got used to it. Do you know what happened? What happened was that about 50 or 100 people rushed in with buses and trucks <laughs> of all kinds. They'd stick a few chairs in, in a truck, in a snake body truck. They'd put a canvas uh, cover over it. One man got a second-hand hearse, a hearse that some undertaker had, you know, given up, and he put some chairs in it, and the way you went around St. John's then was in those uh, trucks and buses and hearses and so on, and that lasted for two or three years, or maybe, I don't remember how long, not maybe that long, and the city stepped in. at all that, and you say in the last 20, 30, 40 years, the things have improved. conference in St. John's uh, we'll for three days and he came down and attended it and we wound it up he and I going on television I think it was on your station television one Sunday afternoon to wind up that thinkers conference he and I for two hours live and he was so magnificent now in 1970 he was such a charismatic personality you know with the cigarette 
He caught hanging out of the corner of his mouth and the hair I'm down over his eyes and needing a haircut no, and screwing up his face. No, no effort at all at looking nice, brother, but pouring out of him with absolute way. sincerity and eloquence in English. Well, I, you, when it's, it's said funny to, to do an interview, I guess, of thinking... Excuse me. Uh, it's uh, going to be played you after were, we're gone. You were born in Quebec, weren't you? Is there you like to say? Well, after you're gone. I said, Is there anything you'd like to say in this last... Exactly. <laughs> he was speaking in such eloquent, persuasive my English. Ever since the man is ball. an eloquent Canadian. And if you weren't advocating the breakup of Canada, Keep we could all love him. And we can respect him in any case. But in never spite of Rainy Levesque, never let I tell you stare us down. that although... Look anyone countries, straight in the eye and say, we may not be the best people in the Western Hemisphere, but we're as good as the best. Always be proud of Newfoundland, and uh, then if that happens, Newfoundland will not go on. We'll go ahead. And they'll mark the X for Canada or against Canada so that Canada's fate is in their hands that day so that by midnight that night, you and all Canadians will be glued to radio and television, finding out whether Canada dies or lives. Of the people of Newfoundland put into a words of song, thanking Joey for his 23 years of service to a beautiful province. Yeah. <laughs> 
But at every cabinet meeting, I didn't allow yeah, any minister to open his mouth. I, I should hope not. I called a cabinet meeting only for the purpose of allowing the cabinet ministers to hear my command. Well, I should, and they asked the detention. Now, I, I was decent. I was decent. About, I could have sent them letters. Well, of course. You were commanded memo. to do this. You were ordered to do that. But Kelly. I was decent about it. I would call them together in a meeting so as to issue my orders, and they would stand up and salute and bow and march out. See. I had some big, built, strong, powerful men that any minister who showed the least sign of I disobedience... I should hope so. ...or failure to, to uh, quickly to obey orders, uh, the cat of nine tails, he was stripped to the waist and strung up by the wrists, and he got the cat of nine tails. I, I mean, I just stood for nothing. I was a complete dictator. Any enemy of mine will tell you that, so it must be true. In the watch fires of a hundred circling camps, they have been with him an altar in the evening hills and lamps. I can read his righteous sentence by the dim and flaring lamp. His day 